they had fun with that one. <laughs> so in case you couldn't tell, in, in planning this service, I was feeling quite autumnal. Not drifted snow, but falling leaves and dusk at five in the afternoon and taking sweaters out of the closet. And the planning of holidays last weekend, I took a very, very long trip in a van. And I had to notice that the, the person sitting in front of me, she spent a significant amount of time designing a menu, creating a shopping list, making a list of things to do that kept getting longer and longer and longer. And that, that felt like the season. And for me, I, I found myself this week making my own list to check and make sure that we have pink and purple candles for the Advent wreath and to make sure that there's papers been ordered and, and all of those things that come with preparing for this time of season. And so as I was feeling autumnal, those famous stanzas of childish poetry came to mind. Over the river and through the wood to grandfather's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh through the white and drifted snow. Who's, who's familiar with that, with that poem? A lot of us, most of us. So what I decided I'd like to do this morning is I decided I'd like to preach a sermon about the life of the woman who composed that poem. So a lot of this sermon is going to be about history, and we're going to get a glimpse into how Unitarianism was practiced 200 years ago, because the person who composed the poem was a Unitarian. But as you'll soon learn, the poet's life was inspiring and meaningful and controversial and challenging and painful. And so as you listen, I invite you to put your own life kind of in conversation with hers. It may mean crossing centuries. It may mean crossing boundaries of gender or race or culture or class. But I invite you to kind of hear her life and, and kind of, you know, uh, put, your own, put your own life in conversation with it. So Lydia Francis was born in 1802 in a small town, born into a country that had just come into existence, was about a couple decades old. Her father owned and operated a bakery. They were not poor growing up, but they were not wealthy either. Her life went through a time of painful and seismic disruption when she was on the cusp of puberty. Within a short amount of time, her mother died from tuberculosis. Her only surviving grandparent died as well. Her closest sibling, her beloved older brother, left home and moved out, moved, out, moved away to prepare for the Unitarian ministry at Harvard. And her older sister, who she relied on, got married and moved far away to another state. Young Lydia was so distraught by these upheavals in her life that she even refused to attend her sister's wedding. So mad at her sister for, for leaving. In a short amount of time, her household became very lonely. Her father, though kind, was emotionally closed and probably had no idea what to do with a household with just him and a preteen. As a result of this profound grief and loss, Lydia turned to spirituality. Um, she began to cultivate a sense in a spiritual world that was alive to her and was a source of intense experiences. So profound was her sense of spirituality that she took the name Mariah as kind of a chosen name to mark a passage. And she ceased to be Lydia and was from then on known as Mariah Child. She also turned to, to spirituality, but she also cultivated an imagination, not having a lot of people to, to talk with. And she began to imagine fictional stories. As she processed her feelings and emotions, she wrote fictional characters and stories that were expressions of, of her emotional state. 
At the age of 21, while living with her brother and his new wife, she was struck by inspiration and wrote her first novel. It was one of the first novels written by a woman in the United States, and it was acclaimed and controversial. The novel was called Hobomok, and it told the story of a British girl who marries a Native American. And boy, that caused a sensation. So you have in 1824, a young debut novelist, a single woman nonetheless, writing a book about an interracial romance in which their relationship, in which the relationship is treated positively, approvingly, and sympathetically. People didn't know what to do with this, but it was a commercial success. So young Mariah, the daughter of a baker, finds herself plunged into the high society literary world, and there's almost a Cinderella quality to her life as she arrives in this world where she feels she doesn't truly belong. And she finds herself surrounded by artists and celebrities and wealthy patrons, and she is very uncomfortable. Even as her star is, right, is rising as this young literary sensation, she begins to experience the limitations placed upon her on account of her gender. A female writer and public intellectual makes her, being a, being a female writer and public intellectual, makes her an outlier in society. And she begins to worry that the cost of being a successful, intelligent woman in the 1820s is that she's going to remain perpetually single. And so she feels this dilemma, writes about this dilemma, of remaining single in order to have unfettered ability to write and create and express her intelligence, or stuff that and deny her creativity, deny her talents, deny her ambition in the hopes of getting married. Then along comes this man named David Child, who is um, progressive and he is, ex embraces the idea of being in love with a woman who is smarter than he is and, and would put no constraints on her writing. And that seems wonderful, except that's probably the only good thing that can be said about him. <laughs> the, man, the man was a piece of work. And everybody knew it. So everybody in, in Lydia's life tells her, don't marry this guy. Don't marry this guy. And, and she does. David is the editor of a political newspaper that's equal parts strident and unprofitable. And early in their marriage, he finds himself embroiled in legal cases. A judge finds him guilty of libel and orders him to pay damages far in excess of his worth, of his net worth. David is also a lawyer, but his approach to the legal profession is curious. He believes it's unethical to represent clients who are able to pay. <laughs> so, so their marriage, so their marriage, Mariah and David get married, and, and soon thereafter, David uh, winds up going to jail for libel and Mariah finds herself essentially homeless. They're married for nearly 50 years, and it never gets much better. There's a pattern in their relationship. David pursues an unwise business scheme that predictably fails, plunging the family into debt. Mariah writes a successful book that lifts them out of debt. David, again, pursues another unwise business scheme that predictably fails, plunging the family into debt. Mariah writes another successful book that pulls them out of debt. Repeat, for 50 years. And Mariah's literary career is amazing. She writes some 47 books in her life, and she needs to because they need to eat. <laughs> she writes out of, out of, not just out of inspiration, she writes out of necessity. She writes novels. She writes a book about homemaking called The Frugal Housewife that turns her into the Martha Stewart of the 1830s. Though she herself never had children, she writes an influential book about parenting. She writes biographies, histories, a three-volume work of comparative religion, 
a book of stories for children. She writes poetry. She writes and writes and writes and writes. And I've gotten this far without even talking about the most amazing part of her life. When Mariah is around 30 years old, she's called upon by abolitionist activists who ask her to lend her writing talents to the cause of anti-slavery. She gladly does this and becomes one of the most influential and powerful writers, calling attention to the extreme immorality of slavery and urging that slavery be abolished. She writes tracts and pamphlets and short stories. She serves as editor of a leading abolitionist newspaper, and she does this at great personal cost. When she comes out as a fervent abolitionist, sales of her books plunge. And, and she, doesn't, she doesn't blink. She is um, willing to accept the personal costs that come with speaking her truth. And so for 30 years, for 30 years, Mariah is one of the most influential figures, influential writers in the movement to abolish slavery. And she finds herself taking positions, advocating and leading this movement, even when she's impoverished and functionally homeless. And in this writing, here are some things she's forced to wrestle with. And, and she winds up putting her own imprint on this movement. Should the abolitionist movement limit itself to the cause of ending slavery exclusively, or should it align itself with other liberation movements, such as women's rights and the concern for Native Americans? Should abolitionism achieve its ends through political victory, or should it focus its efforts on moral persuasion, conversation, and dialogue in the attempt to sway hearts and minds? Should abolitionism adhere to strict pacifism, or is righteous violence necessary to end slavery? Over the course of the decades, Mariah immerses herself in these questions and takes pretty much every position under the sun. Sometimes she sides with pacifism, at other times with violence. Sometimes she believes in moral conversion. In other times she loses faith in this approach and advocates for radicalism. I present one episode from her life that I find spectacular. In October of 1859, John Brown led his raid on Harper's Ferry. His goal was to capture an armory, arm slaves, and lead a massive violent rebellion in which all of the slaves of the American South would rise up and overthrow their owners. The raid fails. Many of John Brown's co-conspirators are killed. John Brown is gravely injured, taken prisoner, and quickly tried so that he can be sent to the gallows. Mariah hears about this and responds by firing off a letter to John Brown in which she asks permission to come serve as John Brown's personal nurse. And John Brown writes her back, answers her from jail, denying her request, but asking her to continue her work furthering the cause. Mariah also at this time is sending letters back and forth with the governor of Virginia debating slavery and then these letters, she takes them and publishes them. And the, the, the copy of her letters between her and the governor of Virginia sells some 300,000 copies in 1859 and become actually one of the galvanizing, one of the galvanizing piecing, pieces of writing in the, in the lead to the Civil War. Even though she spends most of her life in debt, in poverty and in financial anxiety, she also decides to give away much of the money she earns. Following the Civil War, she publishes a series of successful books, but insisted on denying herself tea, butter, sugar, and new clothes, instead donating the proceeds of her books to societies that were working to financially assist the freedmen. Here's how one of Mariah's biographers sums up her literary life. She was a pioneer in several literary genres. She wrote one of the earliest American historical novels, the first comprehensive history of American slavery, and the first comparative history of women. In addition, she edited the first American children's magazine, compiled an early primer for freed slaves, and published the first book designed for the elderly. 
She possessed an uncanny ability for knowing exactly what the American reading public wanted and when they wanted it. She was also gifted at rendering radical ideas, such as the abolition of slavery, palatable for American readers. So what are the lessons that we might draw from her life? One of the things that I want to emphasize is that for Mariah and for the community of writers to which she belonged, spiritual depth and curiosity went hand in hand with social engagement. She was as spiritually radical as she was socially radical. She was a fellow traveler with that constellation of interesting people known as the Transcendentalists, who were spiritual explorers and spiritual experimenters, and their lives were kind of energized by pulsating with a kind of powerful and transgressive spiritual energy. All of her life, she writes about this sense of, of moving close to spirit, even as um, she's facing the life that she faces. She, I think it's, it's interesting that, that the, the writers, the spiritual writers of this age kind of rejected a dualism that would separate spiritual and earthly concerns. For her, they were one. Another lesson I take for her from her life is this willingness to challenge categories more broadly. In her life, she pushed hard against prescribed gender roles, against the racial caste system, against theological categories. In many of her children's stories um, about, about slavery, she writes these, these stories for, for children um, in which feature you know, a, a white child and, and a uh, African-American child, a white child and a slave child, and they kind of have, have lots of, of blending and breaking down of the boundaries that, and the, the, the binaries that we would set up as a society. Her life is instructive in how to push against those boundaries that are limiting. And if you yourself has ever felt yourself coming up against a kind of a, a boundary that was limiting. I think she's a good example of how to push through that. And finally, it's worth noting all of the painful, traumatic, challenging, and disappointing parts of Mariah's life. She knew loss, she suffered, she struggled. She teaches us that it's important to recognize the pain that we carry. And she also, I think, teaches how the life in which we live is, doesn't have to be lived in spite of that, but actually can be one, one with that. Um, in 1844, Lydia Mariah Child penned a children's poem, The New England Boys' Song About Thanksgiving Day. It would become the only piece of writing she would be remembered by. She wrote it in 1844, and here's what she was doing that year. In 1844, she was serving as editor of the National Anti-Slavery Standard, the leading newspaper that was leading the, the cause of abolition. A collection of her letters had just become popular, a popular bestseller, and she was preparing a second volume for publication. Her husband, David, was embarking on an unwise business scheme in which he believed he could sell premium rocks to the railroad. <laughs> and Mariah was living in New York, put up by a family that had taken her in because she couldn't afford a place of her own. And it was there, 1844, that this best-selling author, crusader for justice, transcendentalist, perennially broke woman, pens those words. Over the river and through the wood, when grandmother sees us come, she will say, oh dear, the children are here. Bring a pie for everyone. Over the river and through the wood, now grandmother's cap I spy. Hurrah for the fun is the pudding done. Hurrah for the pumpkin pie. interesting and fascinating life indeed. 
And before we enjoy that pumpkin pie hurrah, we're going to sing our closing hymn. Uh, it is a, a thanksgiving hymn, number 67. We sing now together. I invite you to rise in five.